Hello, this is Alonzo Bowden. I want to welcome you to episode 342 of my podcast, Who's Paying Attention? And today's guest is a great friend of mine, an absolutely hilarious guy. You might know him from Talk Soup, the show that he made famous. No. You might know him from the 147 shows on the Food Network that he has hosted. <laughs> <laughs> you might know him from his stand-up and comedy tours. His Twitter feed is awesome. you got to follow him there. We're going to talk about it. Ladies and gentlemen, John Henson on the podcast. How you doing, my friend? I'm awesome, man. Good to see you, brother. Great to see you. Great to see you. So let's get right into it because you are the first person I get to interview who was canceled. You yeah. were officially canceled. Tell 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 our listeners the story and the aftermath and the whole thing. Um first of all, you play a very important <laughs> role in it. I don't know if that's good or bad. Dude, you are the one who notified me I was canceled. I literally just told this story. So all right. Um, in fairness, uh, it was a minor cancel as a, a cancellation because uh, I'm a very minor person. <laughs> um, but I had been trolling the right pretty hard on Twitter, as you know, um, and uh, and really enjoying it. I mean, deeply, absolutely, deeply absolutely. gratifying. Now, I will tell my listeners the one place where I step in <laughs> with John is I continually remind him to stop fighting with trolls. I, I've been good, man. <laughs> I've been good. I've, st I've stepped back from the brink on Twitter. And I, I got to tell you, the... Um, it's so nice to not spend my day in eternal outrage. It really is like a quality of life you just thing. Remembered you had a wife, children, a dog. Yeah, I'm like, oh, the sun is shining, man. It's a beautiful day. Like, um, but I had been. It started with I, I was doing this thing where um, I don't know if you ever saw this, but I, I'd pick somebody on the right, and I would find a picture of them, and then I'd write a joke on that on that picture. Right. It started with a um, very random guy, Sebastian Gorka. I don't know if people remember him, sort of a Hungarian dude, national security advisor, fucking cosplay spy guy. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I, he's got a goatee and glasses. He just looks creepy. And I, um, I think I posted like, Sebastian Gorka looks like the reason your parents told you not to hitchhike. <laughs> and then like five minutes later, I thought of another one. And then I thought of it, and it became like a game where I just write like 20, you know, yeah. in, in like an hour. And then I did, um, you know, I did Stephen Miller, you know. Stephen Miller uh, looks like a mortician that keeps odd hours, you know what I mean? Or like he looks like Gollum's lawyer or whatever, you know, just like. And then um, eventually I uh, I got to Matt Gates. Mm -hmm. Matt Gates wrote me back. <laughs> um, I got into a flame war with Matt Gates on Twitter for like three hours. It was delicious, man. I think I had written, um, and this was before any of the news about Matt Gates. Broke. Right. I wrote, Matt Gates looks like he invented the roofie. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I think another one was like, Matt Gates. Uh, looks like he owns Ted Bundy's rookie card. <laughs> you know, just weird. I mean, it was just for right, myself. Just you know? random. Um, Although somewhat accurate, particularly <laughs> inventing the roofie, he could yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so eventually um, I was driving my family on vacation. We were on a road trip uh, to Aspen, and uh, it was Father's Day. And we were in the car for like eight hours on Father's Day. It was miserable, you know? <laughs> I mean, just kids in the backyard, in the back uh, seat bitching, and the car smelled like a foot, and just we were out over it, you know? It was the second day. And I pulled over for gas, and, um, and I'm just pumping gas, and I thought, all right, well, I got a couple of minutes. I'll amuse myself. I'll write a, a Father's Day joke. Well, because my whole Twitter feed was <laughs> Trump themed. Um, I wrote, and just forgive me now if you think it's in bad taste, all right? I've already paid, I've served my time. There, there's no bad taste on this podcast. <laughs> I wrote, um, I hope Baron gets to spend today with whoever his father is. <laughs> and um, my perspective was, we all know Trump cheated on Melania. I'll write a joke from the perspective right. of her cheating on him. That seemed fair game to me. Uh, got in the car, never thought about it again. Uh, 
Two days later, I'm on top of Aspen Mountain, literally on the top of the mountain, taking <laughs> selfies with my family. And I hear my phone go ding. And I'm like, oh, Alonzo's texting me. <laughs> and there was a link and no text. And I was like, huh, he's sending me a link to an article in The Hill. And I click on it. And my fucking name is in the headline. <laughs> and I just, it was like one of those moments where you just feel the color drain out of your face. And I, I couldn't say anything to my wife because my kids were there. And I was like, oh, shit. And, uh, <laughs> and I started, I, I went to my Twitter feed and it was like a fucking virtual Trump rally. Like yeah. it was just thousands and thousands of, when you see those red face, no neck dudes wearing MAGA hats screaming at the press, like it was just that for scrolling for days, you know? And um, over the next 24 hours, it was in the New York Post, the Daily News, the Times, USA Today, The Hill, People, Us, Entertainment Weekly. It was in fucking Vanity Fair. <laughs> it was the subject of a discussion with Kellyanne Conway on Fox and Friends. It was on the front page of the Fox News website. Uh, apparently, uh, Melania Trump had issued a uh, her spokesperson, Stephanie Grisham. Right, because you were supposed to be better. Yeah, it, be best. You're supposed Not to just be best. best. I was supposed, supposed to be best, best you That's know? Right. So this... I just have to point out, Stephanie Grisham spent nine months as press secretary, never held a press briefing. Right. You know, spent more time talking about my tweet than she ever did from the White <laughs> House podium when we were paying her salary. But um, they labeled it as uh, offensive and inappropriate, and um, and they they interpreted it, I might suggest willingly, as an attack on Bear. Of course, because they, they're very good at, as they point out, everyone's a snowflake. Right. No one's better at playing victim than a right, right. winger. Now, I, I'll fall on my sword here. It was poor judgment, and I, I, um, I should not have left room for misinterpretation. I gave them the rope to hang me. I wanted to touch the stove and see if I could not get burned. I got burned. Um, however, as a comedian, you will understand when I say objectively, that joke is not about Barron. No, no one who no, found that isn't. joke funny was laughing at Barron. Right. They were laughing at Donald and Melania and their fucking sham marriage mm. or whatever it is. Um, but, uh, you know, death threats. And, yeah, well, they, uh, I mean, the, the fake outrage over it. Now, let me ask you this, because I, I, we haven't talked about this, but if you had said Donald Jr., I think it would not have been an issue because the issue was that Barron was child. was whatever he was, 15 at the mm -hmm. time or something like that. And um, I, I just viewed it as I referenced him in a joke about Donald and Milani. Right. I used his name, but the joke wasn't intended to be at his expense. You know, people, people are going to – nothing I say is going to change the way people are organically going to um, uh, interpret that. I will say – over 50,000 people thought it was funny. That's right. Um, you get you got the follow. And, you know, the first lady knew your name. You know, there was part <laughs> of me that was like, yeah, I landed a punch, didn't I? I threw one that landed all the way in the White House. Um, but it really was a... Um, I will say that it was a very interesting experience to... You know, there aren't many people that have experienced both sides of the circle of outrage. Like, I have both been a part of the mob on Twitter posting my political outrage, and I have been at its mercy. And it's an interesting experience to have walked a mile on the other side. Um, when it happened, you know, in the, um, let's say in the weeks because again we don't have we as a society don't have a long-term memory right right but but in the weeks that happened how much did it affect you as far i know you chilled out on on twitter and social media but in your life like did you you know go to the laugh factory and people like oh shit there's the guy or any of that kind of stuff you know it was we were in quarantine so i wasn't doing sets um I kind of turtled, you know. I pulled back from social media. I, you know, 
Um, I stopped tweeting for several months. Um, I, I took the tweet down and I posted a, a very sort of tightly worded, it was a mistake to mention a minor. I apologize. I'll, I'll, I'll use better judgment moving forward. That was about as much as I felt like I could own it and be yeah. genuine, you know, because I really did, you know, I, I'm sure I spoke to you about it. Like, I struggled with the, um, where was your fucking outrage over innocent children when you were putting them in cages, you know? Right. And, it, well, you know, and again, this is where our hypocrisy as a society, and particularly the right wing, like, they were okay with Sandy Hook. That was all fake. And that, like, that's real. People's children got killed, and you're okay with saying that's fake. Yeah, and those it those is were and crisis that and the other. Those right, were, yeah. Right. No, but, uh, look, I mean, look, apples to apples, Trump directly attacked Greta Thunberg on mm -hmm. the world stage when she was a minor multiple times, and everybody cheered. So the outrage to me was very selective. However, I instinctively knew, like, I can't point that out. The more you defend yourself, the more you right. invite attack. You know, um, I had been asked uh, by uh, somebody that I was working for to address it. I did so in a way that felt... Um, like I was working within honest boundaries. Um, and then I just pulled back. But it was, I, I'm not going to lie, it was a really difficult experience. I got, I got calls and text mails to, uh, texts to my unlisted cell phone number. Mm -hmm. Like it was yeah, it they, creepy. They find you. There are also people in the system that put your stuff out there, right? Like this happens to, uh, government officials and stuff like that when they don't agree and yeah and and it's been shown over and over there are you know and this is no conspiracy theory ended but there are like yeah there are law enforcement people who are trumpers who have access to information that shouldn't be public i had that like well who pulled that number moment you know mm -hmm. um uh in fact i got a buddy um that i had do some looking into it and was able to trace back the numbers and you know right. figure out who it was and they were just they were just Trump fans but i guess the point is it was um I, what i got was the uh, tip of the iceberg compared to somebody like Kathy Griffin right yeah. and 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 it was uh, you feel like you're a polar bear on an ice floe like you 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 feel like it's a very lonely experience because even people who you know, might understand your point of view and agree with you, um, you know, they pull back a little bit because no one wants to be around the stench, you know? So let me, let me ask you this. So as a comic, right, we've all had that experience. We all talk about this. You know, there, there's 99 people laughing and one person isn't, and we're focused on the one that isn't. Dude, if I had in, said that on stage at the Laugh Factory on a, on an APM show, nobody would have batted an eyelash. Right. Even if somebody got pissed, it wouldn't have been a national news but, story. But here's my question, because you talked about it. There were people that supported you. Did you feel that as much as the people that attack you? In other words, the 50,000, say 50,000 people say, yeah, it was a good joke or we support you in this. As the target, do you feel that support the way you feel the attacks? You know, I um, I did not solicit support from the comedy community. the The support that I got were was from Twitter followers who were tenacious and were like, you know, somebody. I remember reading a comment. Somebody was like, "Don't you have children?" And uh, one of my followers said, "Yeah, I've also got a fucking sense of humor." Mm -hmm. Like. It was clearly intended as a joke. And to put it in context, this was, you know, this was right after um, widespread social unrest over George Floyd's death. Right. The middle of the pandemic, financial collapse. And you motherfuckers are clutching your pearls over what was clearly a joke from a guy who's only got, you know, tens of tens of followers. Like, give me a break, man. Like, the emphasis on it was... Um, outrageous to me but isn't that also part of the strategy to deflect from george like instead of the news being george floyd or the news being 
you know, the the people dying of COVID and and the deniers and all of that is like, oh, look at this. This yeah. guy attacked a child. You right. know, isn't that part yeah. of yeah. The, why it was such a big deal? Because it gave them something 100%. to point at. And, They're just taking scalps. And and honestly, I think you know me well enough to know that if I was attacking Baron, you would have known. Yeah, you'd know. You'd know, <laughs> you'd know it, you'd man. Know. There would but, not be any argument. About and it. I think in the comedy world, when it comes to Baron, we're all kind of like, he suffered enough. Like, he really I mean, that's be. a, you know, honestly, I was like, I never would have, I mean, I, you know, I think I also, you know, was sort of mortified in that it never occurred to me that people would interpret that as me attacking a kid. Now, I don't think Barron's scrolling through my Twitter feed, but um, but I, I it, it it's hung around in my head for a while. In fact, I had to sit down and write about it like I was, um, you know, writing an article, you know, for, yeah. uh, for a magazine about it, to, just for myself, not to publish, but just to sort of figure out where I was, what was on my side of the fence, what was on their side of the fence, what I could say, you know, how I could make peace with it, because it was hard. Well, I want to say this, as a friend and as a comic, I'm glad you didn't have to talk to Tucker Carlson. <laughs> oh, my God. That would have been, that would have been like the, the ultimate punishment, right? Yeah, like, like my, gotta... my Ted Cruz spanking, <laughs> you know, where I go on. No, 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 I don't buy that. I don't buy that. Hang on, Senator. Um, now, let me ask you this. When, in talking about support and the comedy community, what do you think of Pat Oswalt with the taking the picture with Dave Chappelle for New Year's? I don't know if you're familiar with this story. Yeah, I am. And, okay, so you take a picture with Dave Chappelle. You're like, we've been friends for 30 years, our whole career, this or that. But I don't support, like, like a qualification of friendship in right. support. What do you think of that? You know, I mean— He's in a no-win situation, right? Like, you're seeing a guy that... Um, I, there's tons of people in my life that I love that I don't agree with every damn thing they've ever done in their life. You know, at what point do I have to carve out my friendship with them to exclude certain behaviors and make sure everybody knows that I'm not just by... You know, I'm... It's... I think the... The issue that you get into is chasing the approval, right? So he took the picture, he posted it, and then there was backlash. And then he's now chasing the approval of the people that, you know, exhibited the backlash by saying, oh, I don't. I don't. And I, I understand the motivation. I'm sympathetic to, to his emotional experience with it and wanting to be liked. We all want to be liked. But it's fucking Patton Oswald, man. Like, yeah. if you're going to look at Patton Oswald and go... That dude is just a Cro-Magnon man, unevolved, you know, misogynistic piece of shit who, you know, doesn't support, uh, uh, you know, minorities in the gay, lesbian, trans right. community. It's like, what? Like, at what point do you put something in context of the entire body of the human beings? Well, and that's that's the way I think. I mean, I love Patton. I, lo I love Patton. I love Dave. I think, but... If you take a pit, like you don't have to qualify the friendship. Like I, I'm friends with Rogan. I'm friends with Adam Carolla, and people. Oh, how can you be friends with him? Because I know him. Yeah, I know they say some shit that I don't agree with, but that's. I'm not going to say I'm friends with him except when he takes ivermectin. Yeah, it's, I'm friends I mean, with him except when he says it's like I'm friends with him. Yeah, so, dude, so, you let me sit in front of this microphone long enough. <laughs> sooner or later, I'm going to say something that makes you go, "Whoa!" Right. You know? it, it's. Uh, I. I'm so. I love Patton, but I don't. I don't agree with. Like we're going to start parsing our friendships and qualifying. You know which part of the guy I like. Yeah. Now you've upset the people that were upset, and you know potentially risked Chappelle going, "What the fuck?" Yeah, mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, they, you they, took the picture because we're friends. You posted it because we're friends, and now I got to hear about what side of me you're not friends with. It's just, it's a tough situation to be in. And the thing is, he's a real person who's your friend. You know, I always say like the Twitterverse, like you know, and f before it was Facebook, then Twitter. It's like it's like high school. This, this ain't real. This is this cool kids, there's nerd yeah. kids, there's angry kids, there's bullies. There's, it's like, but none of these people are real in the sense right. you don't know them, right. you know, and they're going to yeah. they're gonna approve you of you and then the wind's going to blow 
and then they're going to hate you. Call a Twitter follower <laughs> at 3 in the morning, tell him you need bail money, and see if he comes down. I mean, it's that's the thing is... is no, he'll uh, tweet you that you, right. you wouldn't believe John Henson just called me for bail money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I think, that, I think what I learned from my experience is um, I now sort of view... Uh, social media the way a caveman views fire. I know (laughs) that it's powerful and I know that it can feed my family and I know it can burn my fucking house down. And so I treat it with the appropriate respect. All right. So now I want to move on from that. And thank you for talking about that. Like you said, you haven't talked about that before. So I appreciate it. But now let's move over to your, your food network gigs. Because I love this, okay? And I'm going to tell you, this is where I see you all the time. There's a place where I get my nails done. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I get Manny Petties on, <laughs> I wouldn't say on any regular basis, but but yeah, randomly. Yeah. I, I'm not that Cro-Magnon man, okay? I, I groom. <laughs> and they always have the Food Network on. And then I see you dressed as Dracula hosting Halloween cookies Dude, or, uh, or, you know. or some some crazy <laughs> Christmas hat and they're making what how much fun are those shows how did you get into that whole food network it's world it's such a weird thing man the way stuff happens so i love to cook right my when my wife was pregnant with our first son uh, our first child rather um, she got me as a gift uh, four four-hour classes, 16 hours in my own home with a James Beard Award-nominated chef. And at the end of it, I was like, this is like the best present you've ever given me. And um, she said, yeah, you're damn right it is, and I'll go make dinner. You know what I mean? <laughs> so um, a smart woman. I, I, I find cooking relaxing. I find it meditative. And in a weird way, like making somebody laugh, it's a very nurturing, loving thing to do for somebody. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I enjoy it. Years ago, I got a, um, I got a call from my manager and he goes, uh, hey, do you want to do this charity cooking competition on Food Network? And I was like, I don't know, you know, I don't know who's in it. And the, the only two people that had committed were Tommy Davidson and Nicole Sullivan, and both of whom I know and love. And I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, it sounds fun, man. Yeah. Every successive person that signed on, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> like, all of a sudden, I realized, like, I've gone, I'm now... I am the sausage. I'm not going to see how they make the reality <laughs> sausage. I am the guy, you know? And so um, I, uh, I'm i on there with, like, you know, Mike the Situation and yeah. uh, and uh, uh, Barbara Eden from I Love Jeannie. Like, I mean, it was nuts. Um, but I, I had a great time doing it. And, um, and, and then I got a call from my agent like a year later, and she goes, do you want to host this Halloween Baking Championship on Food Network? And I go, I don't know. What's it called? And she goes... Halloween baking championship. <laughs> and I go, yeah, man, catchy title falls right off the tongue. I'm in, dude. Everybody knows Halloween be- themed baked goods. That's my shit, you know? Um, I just, uh, I-, I can honestly say I'm getting ready to do another season of it here in a few months. It'll be like, I think, my fifth or sixth season. Um, it- it's the most fun I've had since Talk Soup. Yeah. I mean, it really is. They're great people. Um, it's a silly show. It's a short gig, and uh, and I I love um, I love it. And I've started to bake because you know the expression like you spend enough time in a barber shop, you're going to get a yeah. haircut. You know, after a couple of years, you're like, I don't know, how fucking hard could it be? You know. So so I want to ask you this because because now baking competitions have gotten real. It's gotten real out there. Okay, is there anyone on the show who's like, yeah, well, let's see you bake something. To, toward you, or is that only toward the judges? You know, I have uh, the first couple of seasons. People were, you know, I, I I had exchanges. I don't know if it was on camera, but people were like, "You don't," because it's these competition shows are fucking hard, man. Yeah, I mean, you're they're long days, and you're busting your ass, and. I mean, this is all stupid shit, but, like, I don't know if you cook, but, like, it's hard enough to cook in your own kitchen. When you have an away game and you're in somebody else's Mm -hmm. kitchen, you don't know where anything is. And, you know, you got 90 minutes and you're running around and shit and you don't know what you're – I mean, it's – so it's a it's an emotional experience. You put a lot of yourself into it, and I and and I let them know like, hey, I've been in your shoes. I know how hard it was, you know. Yeah. Um, so I'm sympathetic to it. Um, but I, um, you know, there. 
it's amazing what these people can do with like gun to your head pressure in no time. Super creative people. I've made great friends doing it. I absolutely love the judges that I work with. Um, and, uh, you know, Carla Hall from The Chew, you know, she yeah. was, uh, I mean, you know, Zach Young, uh, the season we had Stephanie Boswell. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's a blast. It's a, it is a boondoggle gig. Don't tell anybody, but I would do it for free. Honestly, it's like summer camp. Don't worry, no one will hear it on this part. <laughs> so, uh, in in your your hosting, because you've hosted a lot of things, when you were doing Wipeout, mm-hmm. was there anything? And to my listeners, if you haven't seen Wipeout, it is, I'm going to say, an Americanized version of Japanese game shows where they just find ways to abuse the contestant. Yeah, would that be accurate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember running into Johnny Knoxville once, and he goes, uh, "Oh, dude, I love Wipeout." And I go. I was so fucking tame compared to Jackass. <laughs> and he said it, and it was the most, it was the perfect way to sum up the show. And he goes, yeah, I don't know. It's just fun to see people get smoked. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's like we called it Wipeout because schadenfreude wouldn't go over in the heartland, you know? Right. And and I mean, what was there anything where you're looking at these people doing this and you're like, why would you do that? Dude, for eight fucking seasons, people were like, hey, have you run the course? I'm like, do you look at the show? Do I? What are you talking about? I'm the last person. It's like saying to the dude that cuts your fucking roast beef at the deli, hey, man, you slice roast beef. You ever just think about sticking your hand down in there? You ever just go, I wonder what that would feel like. Like, every day I go to work, I see a very convincing <laughs> argument for never running the course. It would be so funny watching these people, they're falling down. And you didn't just fall down. You literally fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. Like, you'd be lucky if you only hit the water, right? We, you know, we we tried to make that show. I, I, I worked hard. If you, if you go back and watch old, you know, the original Wipeout, you know, it was... I don't know if you were like, remember when you were a kid, there you'd be watching Bugs Bunny and all the jokes would be for kids, and then they'd be like firing one fastball over kids' heads <laughs> just for the adults that had to watch. So we tried to play to two audiences, and I was always trying to like push the show a little darker, <laughs> you know? And um, I mean, my fucking catchphrase was good night and big balls, you know what I mean? <laughs> I got away with the dirtiest catchphrase on a family show in TV history. So uh, I ended up... Um, I was always trying to allude to like how hard people were getting hurt, you know, <laughs> and they were very sensitive to that. And um, there's something on the show we called a scorpion where you'd face plant so hard that your feet would come up and touch the back of your head. <laughs> Right, that was the scorpion, and um, I watched. Which is, which, you know what's funny? Just listening to it is funny. Just oh, listening to the I, fact that this happened, people. I mean, it really like it was just horrifying. And I watched this woman face plant so hard, and she scorpion literally soles of her feet on the back of her head, and then she just lay there for a second, motionless, and then got up and started running and. Um, and I had written the joke, uh, you know, she face plans. And then while she's laying there, I jumped in and go, oh, my God, do we need to get new jobs now? <laughs> and then she pops up and starts running. I go, nope, we're all right. And uh, and they were like, no, 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 no. I was like, no, I didn't say anything. I didn't mention <laughs> spinal injury or, you know, catastrophic. No, I mean, you know, they wouldn't let it happen, man. Um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I did sneak in some very inappropriate jokes. I ended up creating, oh, shit, this is my first almost cancellation. I ended up, um, uh, all right, so we had a, a bit where uh, the joke was that I was like Christopher Columbus discovering the new land, and there was an obstacle on it, and I was pretending I was Christopher Columbus. And, um, and so John Anderson goes... Uh, Wait, didn't crew guys build that? And uh, and I just improvised. Yeah, but I bought it off them for a handful of colored marbles in a blanket covered in smallpox. <laughs> and uh, and and everybody laughed, right? And and then, uh, they say, and then it fucking aired, and whoa. the indigenous peoples of America mm. did not appreciate the what I would call Socratic irony where I was highlighting the atrocities right. of the settlers by uh, by illustrating it um, totally on their side but they started a letter writing campaign and so now when that 
episode airs because there was nothing to cut away to when we're on camera. The audio just drops out for 10 seconds and our mouths move and you don't hear anything. <laughs> it's the only edit they can make. It's funny to me, though, that that made the air, that nobody caught that before it aired. That's I had the... to find a way to point that out because they came to me like, hey, you know, they're saying you made light of genocide. And I was like, uh, I, if anything, was trying to highlight the atrocities of genocide. And I understood by all you motherfuckers laughing right. and the fact that 12 executives okayed it and put it on the air that you all understood the spirit in which it was intended and agreed. Meaning, that ain't on me, man. That's on you. So, and, and it's, this is funny. I didn't intend to do this, but we're chronologically going backwards through your career. <laughs> So, and I want to hit on this and then I want to get into some topical stuff. When you were doing Talk Soup, you were kind of on the other side of this. You were the one making fun of celebrities saying something stupid, doing something yeah. stupid, this yeah. or that. Did you ever think, hey, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't do this because I'm going to be the guy. <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of paying my penance now, you know. It was somebody uh, described Talk Soup as uh, YouTube before YouTube. Yeah. And, and, and it was a great show. I mean, people love that show. It was, uh, it was a good show. In fact, I just had, I got a videotape of every episode. So that was part oh, of nice. my deal. And I just finally digitized them. And I'm like, I got over 1,100 episodes of that wow. show. So I'm wow. kind of like, ah, I feel like I should do something with them. Yeah, like that's... go back through and pull sketches and do some sort of MST3K director's commentary bullshit. of Not the clips, you know, because somebody else owns that. But just, I don't know if he would let me. But it's like, it. that was such a... A moment in time that show and it was pre YouTube so it doesn't exist online yeah. you know you can't find it. it's just gone in the ether and it's it's too bad because we did some crazy shit on that show. well it I think it would be one of those shows that hey look what we used to be allowed to do dude it was the look, wild look what we west did, look what we did back when people just laughed right because there were things you you made fun of people and pointed out stupidities that today they'd be like oh no, you're attacking yeah, this. No. You're attacking. Oh man, you can't attack left-handed, overweight people. What are they? they it's, you know, it just. It's. Uh, <laughs> it's. I'll tell you this: is the God's honest truth, man. I, I started in January of '95. I did it for four and a half years, over 1,100 episodes, and um, I didn't have one note session in four and a half years. No one ever fucking sat me down and talked to me about it anything they did not have the infrastructure to watch over us they were just happy that we would hand right, them a tape a and show. go here you go man they aired it when i started they were airing it four times a day they mm -hmm. only had like three shows so it really was let's put on a show in the bar and my mom made costumes like we were just trying to fill airtime. i mean it was like public access to us it was all disposable <laughs> it was great so yeah now that you have it digitized that's what i want you to do man i want you to Pull out the stuff that that you wouldn't be allowed to do today. All of it, dude. <laughs> All of it. There would have been no wipeout. There would be no food network. I wouldn't be sitting in this chair. <laughs> All right. We are going to move to topical stuff now. This, this comes up every now and then. I have been interviewed. I say I'm interviewed on NPR, and I have to speak for all black people when I do. So right now you have to speak for all white people. Got it. I understand you guys can't get the vaccine. Yeah, there's some obstacles. There really are. There's some. I, you know, it's funny. I just met a guy who is uh, who's uh, 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 I, I live out, you know, out in the boonies now, uh, out past Calabasas. And and I met this guy who's an emergency room doctor. And I go, uh, oh, well, let me just tell you that my family and I believe in science. And uh, but I, I bet you don't get a lot of that out here. And he goes, oh, you'd be surprised. Mm. And I go, are you getting like fucking ivermectin overdoses in the emergency room and he goes yeah and it's always somebody with some fucking t tangential connection to the medical community like oh no, no 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 dude my niece is a podiatrist i'm plugged in <laughs> that fucking killed me my niece is a podiatrist oh i have a friend he he's a doctor and he cannot stand like webmd and all of that the 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 quote research people do online and he's always like really internet yeah because i went to school for 12 years and i've been practicing for 20 but you go with that internet 
Uh, I but, mean, it's and also the whole like, you know, you got to do what's right for you. It's like saying hey, the speed limit's 55, but, you know, do whatever's right for you. But here's the thing. This is and this is the insane part. So when Trump says that, like when he says to his followers, a bunch of white people that, well, white people can't get the vaccine. It's like, well, first of all, you guys didn't want it like you. You said you said you you didn't want the the poison vaccine to the fake virus, but now how do you how do they believe it? How how? I mean, look, these are the <laughs> these are the same people that were like, you guys don't give Trump enough credit for creating the vaccine in nine months when it should have taken four years, and you know he's personally responsible for saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lives. But also, you know, that's Jeff Bezos planting a chip inside me and uh, the lizard people are going to track my movements and I'm not going to take your poison. Like it's um, I feel like we're through the looking glass. It, it, there is a um, well, I mean, we were talking about this the other day, the 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 escalation in radicalization and the the mainstreaming, the laundering of fringe theories and conspiracy thinking and and um, and all that stuff you know we saw this enormous escalation in it during the Trump administration in the five or six years you know during the campaign and but the seeds were all planted decades before and- well yeah I mean going back to the southern strategy and you know um, us against them what well, ba- basically it's like what what did uh, what was it Johnson said? If you can convince poor white people that they're better than the worst of black people, something like that, then yeah. they will fight to give you their money. I mean, so, that's what yeah. they did. They basically told poor white people that they're poor because of black people, and then later on added in brown people. Yeah, Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon, Southern Strategy, Lee Atwater. You know, those guys basically said because it used to be that the South was a Democratic stronghold, and right. they basically hatched this plan like, "Hey, let's appeal to their racism," and you know, look at the result. I mean, it's been a basically a you know a sixty year run of uh, uni, universal, uh, virtually support uh, for Republicans in the South. You go back to the John Birch Society and yeah. these outrageous conspiracy theories and the Red Scare and Joe McCarthy and Roy Cohn and you know that 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 shit was just evil. You know. Yeah, I think the thing is, and this is the problem with the internet that. Now the crazies find out they're not the only one. Right. You know, now it's like, oh, there's a million other idiots just like me. Now my idiocy is legitimized. Right. It galvanizes. There's um, strength in numbers, right? And they they escalate. They feed off of each other. I mean, it's like these people that are, you know, in Texas waiting for, you know, Kennedy to come back. Yeah, and he didn't. I think that's kind of selfish of him. To not come back. I they, mean, they gathered, they waited. TikTok, dude. These guys are <laughs> you know, these are working class people. They took they a got, day off. They got a hotel they room. A it's a lot. <laughs> you know, you got to take time off of work. Um, no, I mean, it's it is, uh, and I think you know, if you if you really go through um, through the years, uh, uh, the decades of uh, the Southern strategy, and then leading into um, you know, Reagan really made a conscious attempt to bring. Uh, white evangelicals into the tent by making uh, what was previously a, a not a political hot button issue of abortion a political you know mm-hmm. flashpoint and then um, you know then you get into like the 90s and Newt Gingrich uh, and the and the Republican Revolution and those and Newt Gingrich is like a seminal figure in terms of escalating rhetoric I mean it, they um, they they really began to shape. The political opposition is not opposition, but the enemy. Yeah, and in a spoken way, where where any compromise is weakness. You can't compromise not right. one bit. Right. Congressional gridlock is a strategy. Right. And um, and then you know you get the in 1996 the advent of Fox News and the Fox News essentially separated conservatives from the mainstream media ecosphere and they got this echo chamber and you look you know they they they're they got to find another, right? They find another, and then you know, just as an entertainer, 
you can't stay at one level. Mm-hmm. You've got to keep dialing up the heat. And all that was just decades of kindling. You know, I think it was Sherry Atwater, was that her name, in, in uh, the in Nevada congresswoman who came out like, there's Sharia law in yeah. Michigan. Right. It's like everybody and their brother knew that she was batshit crazy, but it was like Republicans went, eh, you know, you're, and it started to mainstream nut jobs in Congress. Well, you don't get Marjorie Taylor Greene and Sarah Palin. Bober. Yeah. Sarah Palin was the one who. You know, I mean, and, and, you know, jokingly, someone said recently, like, remember when she was crazy? Like now crazy has moved so far beyond Sarah that you're like, oh, that would be nice just to have her her level again. Come back, Sarah. All is forgiven. (laughs) I mean, remember when Dan Quayle was the dumb guy? You know what I mean? And now Dan Quayle is the one who literally was smart enough to tell Pence, hey, man, just leave it alone. Like, you can't do it. So moving on to another story because this is this is where it's a bigger problem the fact that we have people who do have positions of power who are in this you know conspiracy crazy whatever you want to call it so in minnesota this judge ordered there was a covid-19 patient now let me get get my notes so i get the name right cuz you know i don't want yeah, that's not true. I do want to get canceled. We want to boost this podcast. But anyway. <laughs> that gives you oxygen. A guy named Scott Queener, or Quinner, however it's pronounced, from Coon Rapids, Minnesota, because oh, okay. where else Where else would he be from? All right. You know what? I think I know everything I need to know about this story. <laughs> okay. Unvaxxed. Um, he's on a ventilator for months. No improvement. Finally, the hospital says, take him off the ventilator, right? The judge has him flown to Texas and put in a hospital on another ventilator. The judge, you know, court ordered the hospital to do this. His GoFundMe so far has raised $70,000. But see, this is the thing. It's one thing we joke about and we laugh about crazies. But when a judge steps in and tells a hospital, hey, Screw all your medical knowledge and the fact that you're wasting this ventilator on some unvaxxed guy who it it should be used on somebody who's an unfortunate victim versus right that someone might who, respond that might spend five days on a ventilator and then you yeah. give it to somebody else. So we, so this is the problem though we and we hear this over and over where we're having judges in particular who are. I don't even know what word to use, part of the conspiracy or a belief in the conspiracy where they use their power to, you know, for this right. nonsense. What, what, how do you, how do we, how does our society battle that? How do you, how do you chant? Right. Cause a judge, I always said a judge is like a baseball umpire. Like in other sports, you can argue, you don't argue with a baseball umpire. He looks at you like, are right. you done? Right. Are you done? Right. Do you You're want to stay out. in the game? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's, and that's the judge. That's the power a judge has. You know, I I, I heard somebody uh, say that unvaccinated people who die of COVID have essentially commit suicide by petulance. Yeah, they volunteer. That's you what know? I call them volunteers. Um, and and I think you know when you've got it's it's bleeding now into. I mean, look at, look at the Supreme Court. Right, the Supreme Court fast tracks this ruling on this mandate. They're going to hear the case quickly. Uh, They're going to rule on the case quickly, and they're going to strike down Biden's vaccine mandate for government workers. Can I just say, and I tweeted about this, this is why Judge Judy should be on the Supreme Court. Because you had two lawyers who had COVID arguing against the mandate. Judge Judy, that you're, you're done right yeah. there. You cannot have COVID and argue against a vaccine mandate Listen, in Judge Judy's court. I've met Judge Judy. <laughs> the last thing on earth you want is her undivided attention. You know what I mean? Um, no, but it's it is there. They they drag their feet over certain cases, but they could not wait to rule on that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Um, and. And I wish there was a simple answer because really what we're seeing is the tentacles of um, of extremism and division are just sort of weaving their way into state and local jurisdictions, into school boards, into jur- uh, jurisprudence, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we are now at, at a place where I think there is a more um, 
malignant division in this country than at any other time since the Civil War. And, and you know, um, I, I look at it as I think it's objective that um, we're, we're in an unprecedented situation where one, seemingly the majority, not even seemingly, the majority of one political party has aligned against more than 250 years of democratic policy and, and, and ethics. And, and, and I don't know, you know, I don't know that there's a silver bullet to it, right? Like once you stretch out that kind of uh, elastic, it doesn't snap back. But the question is, will the left fight back? When will the left fight back? You know, this is, I've, I've always said this is where I disagreed with Michelle Obama. You know, when they go low, you go high. It's like, no, nah, when they go low, you got to go low, too, on, on these. Because we're looking what we're looking at now with the Voting Rights Act. If the Democrats surrender on this, Republicans take the midterms, take the next take every election that you can project because they will just simply right. make it illegal for, for your opposition to vote. I mean, ba- based on verifiable evidence of what they're doing at the local and state level and and with voting rights and restrictions and all that stuff there is no sci-fi fantasy that you would go dude that's never going to happen right like it it is fascistic in 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 nature so um i i kind of agree with you i think you gotta the you gotta you gotta meet the fight where the fight is right, right. and and um and and i think you know th- the way I see it is the challenge that we have is democracy in general, but the Democratic Party in specific in this situation is a big, broad coalition that includes a huge range of viewpoints and, and you know, people's kind of pet projects and all that kind of stuff. So it's sort of blunted and round because it's got to incorporate all these people, whereas Republicans are a minority, but they are all lined up and they have honed their strategy and their um, their tactic to the point of a spear. And so it's difficult to to push back against something that's sharpened and unilateral and uniform in its t- strategy when you've got all these different voices and viewpoints arguing right. for how to how to go about it. And I get that. I understand what you're saying. But with the Democratic Party, like, when are they going to learn? When the leadership, okay, and I'm, I'm looking at Pelosi, looking at AOC as being one of the louder voices, uh, Bernie, um, the, the influencers, the, the ones who are, you know, twisting arms backstage or however you want to put it. Like the way McConnell tells Republicans, you will get in line. You will, you know, and you, you ask a question and every Republican gives the same answer because you know yeah. there was a meeting where they said, we don't care what you think. Yeah. If you want us to build a bridge in Coon Rapids, Minnesota, right. then you're going to say yeah. this. When did a Democrat say, OK, listen, these are the this is the important issues. These are the ones we have to win. We understand you got 100 other things. We have to come together on this. Um do you think there's anything that is going to push that button? Um, God, it's such a good question. I want there to be, but I'm not sure there is. I think, you know, you the way you can sort of position it is, imagine if Republicans held these cards. Imagine how they would line up behind a single message, the, the, the tearing of hair and rending of flesh that they would make in 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 our shoes you know right. what i mean the messaging would be so effective and there would never be one republican like mansion there would never be one republican holding up the whole thing they'd be like oh no we're gonna we're gonna destroy him either right. you get in line or you know we got everybody at fox news to destroy you publicly or what however they decided to do it i mean the mansion problem is you know you could go hey man strip him of all of his committees and basically sideline him and say look if you're going to play this game where you know all you care about is your own re-election in west virginia you don't recognize that john tester has got his own election and all these people you know then then what you risk is him going all right fuck it now i'm a republican yeah you know what okay. I mean? Okay. Be one. You but already then, are. But then you but then you're are you in any different shoes? 
You know what I mean? And 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 you know, um, you know, I, it is. Um, it is. Uh, you can never underestimate Democrats. Ability to step on their own dick. I mean, it, it is it, it is really, really frustrating. I, I don't know about you, but when I sat home and read about the defund the police movement, I went, "What the fuck are you doing?" The worst slogan Shut in the your history. Fucking mouth. How do you how do you own Hollywood and not be able to come up with a better slogan than yeah. defund the police? Guys, run it by somebody. <laughs> run it by somebody. You know what I mean? I'm a dude with some college on my resume. Right. If you would called me i would have gone no 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 yeah the you 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 know you control everything in in hollywood and publicity and media and that's the best slogan you could come up with it's almost like you know like like the way and and i don't know if you're aware of this but january 6th insurrection was entirely run by antifa um, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and it's the same way where defund the police. This almost sounds like the Republicans came up with this one and, and gave yeah, it to like, them. like they, uh, you know, hey, uh, what if we defund the police and then they, re- you know, run off back into. I mean, you know, the the other thing is it's not a level playing field, right? Like there, look, not. there's definitely you know not. CNN and MSNBC are obviously they have their own point of view. They're everybody's pitching their own shit. It's a dirty game, but. You know, Fox News is an entirely different animal. Yeah. And and when you're talking about the verify, I mean, if God forbid Rachel Maddow was calling Joe Biden on his cell phone and going, dude, you got to fucking invade Russia mm-hmm. if they go into Ukraine again. And he was ripping off a tweet like the the absurdity of people like uh, that aren't even journalists, they're pundits, they're just right. talking fucking heads, having a hand in U.S. policy and then lying on their show and and carrying water for it, you know, it really is dystopian, it's Orwellian. The the false equivalency, and, and again, this is their narrative. See, that's the thing, they control the narrative. So they're the ones who are saying that MSNBC is the same as Fox News. Right. Like, no, it's not. Yeah. You know, 10% left versus 90% right, you know, or whatever. All right. Yeah. We're going to move on cause just because of time constraints, because okay. I could talk to you all day. I do want to talk about this one story, because this is one of those stories where, to me, again, you're speaking for white people one more time. Yep. I got but it. But this is where it's... I talked to them all on the way in. <laughs> well, it's funny, because when you point these things out to white people, it, like... Okay, let me sh- let me explain to you how different the situation is. Okay, when you say there's no such thing as white privilege or whatever, I don't know if you heard this story. This is fascinating. Okay, Kenneth Ray Paynes, and they always have three names. They always have three. Is names. he an assassin? <laughs> I mean, so Kenny Ray got upset with the dealership in Austin, Texas. He rammed his Dodge truck into the car dealership and then took out his AK-47 and started walking around the dealership with an AK-47 in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other, (laughs) looking for somebody, okay? And now they're saying, the police are saying, we can't find this guy, okay? So, like, nobody stopped him. Like, there was no good guy with a gun, at work that day, uh, I man. guess. And and it, here's the thing. Where okay. did he get the coffee? Are there free refills? <laughs> just go wait. So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Let's just imagine. Let's just imagine. Here, here's the headline. You can see it. That a black guy oh, dude. rams a car dealership gets out by the way the, the best thing about old kenny ray he's wearing yeezys uh, so. i was about to say and <laughs> and uh, i mean you know i think we if he's a rapper we will put lil in front of him <laughs> lil kenny ray i mean kenny look ray. at that look at that camo i mean it uh my god so if a black or a brown person rammed a car dealership with their car got out with an ak and start walking around looking for somebody the question isn't would they be able to find him how many steps before he got shot, if a if a if a black man in Texas accidentally <laughs> got get, you know what I mean hit a car dealership, he's not even making it out of the car. I mean that's a you know uh, well it's a stand your ground and your dealership law <laughs> that we have here. And then they're like, we can't find him. Like, how can you not find his his truck has a license plate? You know his name. I mean, how do you not find? Kenny you got to start with the places that you don't need to look. Right, you don't need to look 
in a dentist's office. You don't need to look in a library. There's some places that you're not going to find Kenny Ray. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, would, I would assume uh, you want to start looking at duck blinds in the area. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, there, if there's uh, maybe a strip joint out by the airport. So, you know, you can accuse me of stereotyping or whatever, but there's certain, and you picked up on it right away. The minute you hear Coon Rapids, Minnesota, you're like, okay, we're, we're done. We, yeah, I mean, the story writes itself. <laughs> right, when you hear, you know, when it's Kenny, Kenny, what's Kenny Ray's full name? When you hear three names, this is what I'm talking about. It's always a guy with three names. Kenneth Ray Paynes. Yeah, the minute you hear Kenny Ray Paynes, you know something ain't right. I mean, how do they have his name and they don't know where to find him? How many hey, places can this, how many people does he know that will let him in a house? And here's the thing, you know, it's not like his name, like this is Jalopnik. Jalopnik is a car guy's like online news. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Jalopnik. In other words, Jalopnik's not cracking news. Like, Jalopnik knows who Kenny Ray is. (laughs) Forget about it. We're not talking about the New York Times. We're not talking about some super investigative reporter. The story pops up on Pornhub, (laughs) for God's sake. They got his name. I don't know. Make some calls. I mean, you know. Damn it. I want want him to find Kenny Ray. This this is getting, this is going to be All you got to do is find out which one of his daughters he's banging and then sit on her crib. Go to StockX and see where he ordered those Yeezy boots. You I, can't buy those. You gotta. Oh, you can't. You gotta go to a sneakerhead and say, hey, "Where where Kenny Ray ordered those boots?" Right. <laughs> I, I, the the best part is he was upset that they didn't have his spinners ready. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is he? So the final thing for the podcast, um, and I warned you this ahead of time, so you had time oh, to think All about right. it. Yeah. Good news, man. Give us give us some. We 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 live in a time we talked about it from. Voting rights to, yep. to right. Kenny Ray shooting people to vaccines. What well, give us some good news? All right, this is um, this is low hanging fruit, um, uh, and I, I, I might I might be putting a little bit of English on this, but the round of subpoenas that went out to Giuliani, Sidney Powell, um, uh, who is the uh, uh, there was one other woman, um, I think uh, Boris Epstein, um, and then they're subpoenaing the, the, the phone records, not the actual you know content of the phone records, but um, uh, Eric Trump and uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle. Um, I will say this. I don't think any of those people will comply, and I do not have any faith that any of them will be brought up in charges. However, not responding, going in and taking the fifth, is going to... That's a wrap on their legal careers, right? Sidney Powell, uh, uh, Boris Epstein, uh, Rudy Giuliani's already, you know, had his law license revoked in D.C. I, I am just... A small enough man that I um, I want to know that some price is being paid, and and for them to not be able to earn a living, for them to basically find the end of their rope, um, that to me is a bit of a butterscotch that I just want to roll around on my tongue for a little while. There's a um, do you remember the there, there's a, a a documentary called The Courtship of Rivals: Bird versus Magic? Yeah. And one of the most chilling things I've ever heard a human being say was when Bird eliminated Magic in the finals. And he goes, uh, they're talking to him. This is like fucking 35 yeah. years later. And he goes, um, you know, he was hurting. And, um, you know, he, he hadn't played a great game. And um, I knew he was suffering. And, um, you know, nobody was happier than me, man. It's not enough to win, but to know the other guy's suffering. And I just thought, <laughs> motherfucker, that is the coldest blooded thing I've heard Listen, 35 years hey, later about no, a man he says he loves. That's French Lick. Yeah. That's, that's right. like Coon River. That's right. French Lick. Right. And that, to me, it's like, it's not enough to win, but to know the other guy is suffering. To me, there's a little bit of suffering attached to that, no matter how they play out that hand. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I, I hate to be devil's advocate on your good news, but unfortunately, there's always a job at, at Fox News for these people. Now, there will not be a, a job at OWN Network because DirecTV just said, now nah, we're not propping you clowns up anymore. So, yeah. so that network's going. There's some good news that that network is losing its funding. 
my my problem with the subpoenas and the investigations and the whole congressional thing is they're just stretching it out to the midterms when the Republicans take over and then it's it all gets dropped. Well, that's why they're going to have these hearings, right? They're going to have these hearings in January. And, I, you know, I, I got to read you something if I can call this up, man. There's a um, there's a I, did you ever read the quote by Alexander Hamilton where he basically predicted um, Trump? Uh, in 1792. Uh, And, uh, uh, you know, this is how fucking smart these guys um, were, specifically Hamilton, Um, that this guy wrote this uh, in, in 1792. Um, When a man unprincipled in private life, desperate in his fortune, bold in his temper, possessed of of considerable talents, having the advantage of military habits, despotic in his ordinary demeanor, known to have scoffed in private at the principles of liberty, when such a man is seen to mount the hobby horse of popularity, to join in the cry of danger to liberty, to take every opportunity of embarrassing the general government, government and bringing it under suspicion, to flatter and fall in with all the nonsense of the zealots of the day, it may justly be suspected that his object is to throw things into confusion, that he may ride the storm and direct the whirlwind. Now, if there's a little bit of good news, it's that if that motherfucker was so smart in 1792 that he was trying to structure a government that That couldn't couldn't fall under the hand of a guy like that maybe if you extend the playing field i mean i I think the reality is the best we can hope for is it's not going to be cataclysmic it's not going to be satisfying it's not going to match the crime and it's not going to be what we want but you know evil carries within it the germ of its own subversion and that it leaves behind in men at least the sense of unease and sooner or later uh uh i would like to think if you extend the arc long enough these people are going to wash out they're never going to get what's coming to them no they won't but we and we don't have time to go into it but that's where i get into the hope for the nation is the generation beyond generation z those young people are are the hope because they've had enough yeah. they, they've had and they're smart and you know so so that is where my hope lies yeah it'd be so you know it's up to New York listen New York will start putting Trumps in jail if there's Let's one your man, if tish. there's one if one city and state that just don't give a shit yeah they don't New play. York is yeah. like yeah we we going after you we we've already gone after the money right we got the money and the, and the beautiful thing is you bring Donald Jr to the stand because he's an idiot that that's the the fun thing like you know how much fun it would be for her to play with Donald Jr because there's nothing more fun than someone who thinks they're smart. Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really it. When you have someone who thinks they're smart uh, up against someone who is smart, you're like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah. And and yeah. I think he is... Everybody's the, got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Right. He's the weakest link. He's the weakest link in the chain. Right. And Whereas Eric Trump is just like keeping farts in a jar. Yeah, you know Eric, I mean? Eric knows how dumb he is. You know what I mean? Eric's like, nah, I ain't, I'm not smart enough to I go have there. trouble just following the conversation. <laughs> I don't want to be the guy that talks a lot. Man, I love this. Thank you. Oh, John. dude. Thank you Great so much to see you. Um, for, for coming in. And, and he brought gifts, people. He brought me nougat. He um, brought- I, honestly, I just want to say, I pray I never ever get another text like I got from you on Aspen <laughs> Mountain, man. But thank you oh, for man. looking out for me. No, really, that was it was like, oh, because we had talked about that, and I remember you asking me, was this tweet a good idea? And I was like, I, I don't know. But then when it hit, it was like, wow. You know, that was, um, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. It, it Like you said, it, the intention was that it was not a joke aimed at Barron. No. It was a joke aimed at the the ridiculousness of the family and cheating and and this and that. Yeah. But people decided they wanted to be outraged, and that that's another thing we have, right? That's what the right. whole cancel culture is about. We decided to be outraged yeah. over something yeah. that you know. And by the way, if you are fucking watching this and you have just learned about this tweet and you are outraged, do 
not at me. I'm just going to make it clear right now. As, uh, as, uh, as, as some people that we know would say, that is last month's light bill. I have paid that fucking bill, and I am not paying it anymore. You leave my friend John alone, and I am not qualifying this friendship. We are friends through, through tweet and tweet. We are friends. That's right, man. Uh, this weekend, I am going to be at the Grand Comedy Club in Escondido, California, Friday and Saturday. John, you have anything coming up? What should the people uh, look for I you? do. I've got a new Food Network show that I'm going to be filming uh, in about a month or so called Stab That Cake. Uh, and uh, I will be back on this season of Halloween Baking Championship when it comes around in Halloween. Um, and uh, i got a couple of producing projects. I'm trying to move behind the camera, man. It's, uh, All right. I'm getting a little long in the tooth for reading well, great, English man. off a teleprompter. <laughs> Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, John Henson. Follow him on Twitter unless you want to be mad at him. Then yeah. just don't bother. <laughs> just If you're going to correct him, don't. Yeah. If you're mad at me, talk to Alonzo. He's bigger than I <laughs> uh, Dude, that was so much fun. Thanks. Uh, so